Welcome and thank you for joining us today for DDI Directions, DNS, DHCP, and IP address management strategies for the multi-cloud era. My name is Raleigh Gould and I'll be moderating today's event. Our featured speaker is Seamus McGillicuddy, Vice President of Research covering Network Management at Enterprise Management Associates. Seamus has two decades of experience in the IT industry as an industry analyst and journalist. His research focuses on all aspects of managing enterprise networks. While Seamus will defer answering your questions until the conclusion of today's event, we do encourage you to log your any your questions anytime throughout the event using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA with resources from today's event. So I hope you'll check that email out. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our featured speaker, Seamus McGillicuddy. Seamus? Thanks, Raleigh. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. So I'm here to talk about the uh, state of the art uh, the future of, the direction of DDI, DNS, DHCP, and IP address management. DDI stands for those three things, usually refers to a suite of technologies that are integrated to handle uh, addressing and uh, in networking. Um, it's a multi-sponsor research project, meaning that these three vendors you see here that are all DDI vendors, Blue Cat, Efficient IP and Fusion Layer, uh, financially supported independent analyst research. Um, they did not get to see the slide deck. They did not get to see the report before I completed it. They simply uh, got to talk to me about you know, the survey um, before I put it out in the field to uh, sort of give me their impressions on what kinds of insights they'd like to see. And um, But I also had final say on what the questionnaire for the survey looked like as well. So definitely independent research. Uh, here's the agenda for this presentation. We're going to talk about why I did DDI research um, because you don't really see a lot of DDI research out there. Uh, most people are more interested in other topics when it comes to networking and doing market research on things like uh, SD-WAN or multi-cloud or security or whatever. Um, DDI is kind of this thing that's been around forever and people just uh, figure it's there and they don't need to worry about it. So, but I think that it's worth looking at. So I'm going to talk about why I did it. Um, then I'll talk about what the uh, end users that I both surveyed and talked to one-on-one -on -one told me are the essential capabilities they need in DDI technologies and solutions. Then we'll talk about some key uh, areas of investigation of this research. First, DDI and network automation. What, how, what are the relationship between those two? Um, then DDI in the cloud, um, you know, uh, DDI is, you know, long time was basically like um, a foundation of network services for your on-premise network and also had a big role to play in wide area networks. But in the cloud, things might happen differently. And um, as it does with everything that has to do with IT, when things move to the cloud, it becomes very cloudy there and things get chaotic and IT organizations often lose control. So we're gonna look at how DDI teams in particular are trying to get a handle on that. And then we're gonna look at DDI security with a particular focus on DNS security, but we're gonna look at all aspects of DDI security a little bit in this presentation and even more so in the full report, which was published very recently. So research goals and methodology. Um, DDI refers to, as I mentioned, a suite of services, uh, domain name system, uh, DHCP, and I'm not going to try to pull that acronym from memory at this moment, uh, dynamic host configuration protocol. There, I did it. Um, and IP address management. Um, these are the three basic core components of a DDI solution that basically um, ensures that things are you know, reachable on a network. Uh, main capability is like the assignment of IP addresses and correlating those IP addresses with uh, domain names, uh, human readable domain names. So that for instance, when you type in a URL, it can be resolved as uh, uh, you know, the IP address of the website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's more than that. It's more than managing IP address and, and domain names. You know, you know, the traditional view things, you know, I'm thinking about like conversations I had like 15 years ago with people like, oh, it's just, you know, it's it's not a, it's not a product. It's not a solution. It's not innovative. Um, we 
have an Excel spreadsheet with all of our IP addresses on it. And that's that scales, I think. I talked to someone for this researcher told me that his Excel spreadsheet before he adopted a commercial DDI solution had 100,000 lines on it. Um, and he was you know, managing a network for a $7 billion company. Um, he also, uh, we can get by with free DNS servers like Microsoft dump bundles a free DNS server with Active Directory. That can take care of a lot of our needs. Uh, and elsewhere, we can handle it with open source. And that's great. That will work. Well, no, it doesn't work. All our research shows that doing, doing that for DDI is a mess, is, is, a, is a, a recipe for disaster, basically. Um, the reality is only 40% of the people in our survey feel that they are fully successful with DDI. And a lot of those guys actually have commercial solutions, not just homegrown stuff like on the left of this, of this slide. Um, the engineers and architects, like the people who have technical job titles, um, working more closely with the technology, they were more pessimistic about their overall success with this stuff than the CIOs and the CISOs and the CTOs in the survey, because we got a little bit of every, all different levels of an organization in the survey, which I'll show you in the next slide, or in a couple of slides. Um, and we also found uh, in this survey that investment in enterprise DDI solutions typically leads to these three benefits. These are the top three benefits that people experienced when they were actually investing real money and resources in a commercial enterprise grade solution. They improve overall resilience of the network, less downtime associated with a mistake in configuring or assigning IP addresses, et cetera, uh, or a badly configured uh, mis mis mismanaged DNS record or something. Um, 44% said they had enhanced IT productivity and agility because there's a lot of automation that happens when you uh, mature your approach to DDI. For As one example, there are other ways that that productivity and agility happen. Uh, and also they reduced security risk, which we'll go into in quite a bit of detail in a minute. So I felt, felt this for a while because I have done some custom research for some clients in the space before I did this project and we're seeing indications of this already. Um, DDI is a strategic technology. It may not be seen by all as uh, an area of innovation. You're not going to see it on any kind of hype cycle. <laughs> like it's already moved way off of the hype cycle. Um, but it's it's really critical in a lot of ways, based on my conversations with people. As you see, this uh, this guy at a Fortune 500 consulting company on right, he just says it plainly. It unifies everything and. What does that mean? It pulls things together. It reduces complexity. It automates. It secures. It controls. Uh, top drivers of DDI investment. The things that people are doing that lead them to invest in DDI, saying, you know what? We need to get serious here. Hybrid cloud, network and IT automation initiatives, and public cloud and or multi-cloud architecture. So. They move into the cloud, they hybridize cloud with private data center, they try to automate everything, and they're like, we need to do something about our DDI approach. The DDI stack is broken, it's ancient, it's got 100,000 lines of IP address assignment information in the Excel spreadsheet, it's not gonna work. So how do IT organizations establish a modern DDI service stack to support all that? Uh, that's the goal of this research. Uh, demographic view of the 333 DDI experts that I Surveyed or here, you see is a mix of technical personnel, middle management types, and a little bit of IT executives. Always good to see what they're looking at from their ivory towers. Everything's peachy from where they are. And then those guys, admins, engineers, architects, are like, ah, everything's a mess. Everything's on fire. Um, IT groups, lots of network engineering types. We also got some cybersecurity types, some cloud ops, net ops, IT architecture people. I uh, have more than a dozen industries represented. These are the big ones, the financial services, the manufacturing people, media, entertainment, content provider types. I've um, been seeing a lot of them in my research lately. Uh, retail and, and non-IT professional services. Uh, all IT service providers like hardware and software vendors are excluded from this. Um, and then you see like revenue, it's everything from 100 million up to 5, 10 billion. Uh, lots of different, uh, lots of small enterprise, mid-market and large in terms of headcount. And as a transatlantic view, 
uh, North America, Canada over here, uh, the UK, Germany, and uh, uh, France across the Atlantic. So essential DDI capabilities. Uh, on the left, you see we asked, you know, what are the critical capabilities you want from an enterprise DDI solution? Um, top of the list, security. People are especially concerned about securing DNS. And so they want security features from a DNS solu a DDI solution. Um, things like um, maybe a DNS firewall, support for uh, uh, DNS uh, security extensions, um, uh, maybe the ability to encrypt certain aspects of the, the stack uh, in terms of communications. Um, things like that. Um, they also need scale and performance, makes perfect sense. Uh, especially as people move in the cloud, they start talking about scale and performance because like the cloud just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if they're gonna, they need to scale uh, their network services to support that. Uh, and then fully integrated stacks. So they want DNS, DHCP and IPAM to be completely integrated uh, so that if they make it a change in IPAM, for example, it is coordinated with their DNS services. Their DNS servers are aware of changes in the IP address space and vice versa. Um, and then secondarily, they want ease of use. They want multi-cloud support and resiliency. Uh, customer support and network discovery are secondary or tertiary requirements. However, um, people who told us that they're the most successful with their overall approach to DDI not only tended to have a, make security features a higher priority, they also told us that network discovery was a higher priority. Um, so. Why is that? We'll touch on it a little bit more in a second. Um, we also found that technical personnel, people like admins, engineers, and architects, who are the ones that are probably working most closely with the DDI stack on a daily basis, were more interested in discovery and less interested in a fully integrated DDI stack, partially because they know they got a lot of overlays that need to work with. Um, they can't expect uh, one vendor to solve all their DNS requirements because they have people in the cloud who are adopting one, two, three, four different DNS services that they need to uh, integrate into their overall DNS stack through something besides fully integrated technology. Um, more on the value of network discovery. So these are quotes from people I interviewed one-on-one. -on -one. I like to talk to like a half dozen people one-on-one -on -one, um, to get their perspectives, add a little bit of color and insight into the, what I'm seeing in the data. And so here's a couple people who were talking about discovery specifically. I've already quoted this guy from the Fortune 500 consulting company. He's the one that said it unifies everything DDI. Here he says, I have a feeling that our IPAM is not as up to date as we would like it to be. It's hard to find a person who owns an IP address. Sometimes vendors could help by providing good discovery tools that can go out, find devices, identify their addresses, and correlate that with our IPAM. IPAM should not be a passive tool. It should be, it should collect information from a live network and discover what's happening. Basically, what he's saying is like, even though he's got an enterprise grade solution that's in control of his general IP address space, there's still people out there that are circumventing it and like assigning IP addresses from a legacy tool um, that he doesn't have full visibility into or control because his enterprise, you know, is constantly acquiring new companies. Um, he just he doesn't know everything that's happening now. We're gonna be nice if his IPM tool could go out there and discover what's in his IP address space. Um, and then this network engineer at a Fortune 500 financial services company said it would be great to have a more robust discovery tools within his IPAM and full stack DDI solution that he's using. I don't want to go in and homebrew solution to get the data I need. I want to have it all in one place. And he doesn't see that in his tool right now. Maybe his tool doesn't do it very well in the cloud, or maybe it does or doesn't do it very well across a wide area network, or maybe he needs to have appliances installed in every location in order to have full discovery. Um, these are examples of why they're not fully satisfied. Um, but IPAM should integrate with third-party DNS and DHCP services. As I mentioned, this stuff is pervasive. Typical enterprise in our research was using at least like two or three different types of DNS for private DNS, um, and also two or three different types of DNS for public DNS, you know, stuff that's for internet reachable services as opposed to uh, services that are internal like email and printers and stuff. Um, so despite the fact that people want full stack solutions and make that a high priority, they 
they have a lot of third-party DNS and DHCP services, and they need to have some kind of overlay integration of their IPAM with those third-party services so that any changes in their IPAM, any, any changes in IP address space are orchestrated across those third-party services if necessary and vice versa. You see this project manager at this um, oil and gas company, Fortune 500 oil and gas company. He says, DNS is an internal struggle. We don't have a set owner. It is in this gray area where it's touched by multiple groups owning services for their own needs. He referred to NetOps, DevOps, um, server team had their own DNS. Um, he couldn't get control of it. He didn't have the authority to do it. And so he couldn't force them to use something that he had from his IPAM provider. He needed to have overlay integration to orchestrate DN, uh, network services across all these disparate services. Um, the successful DDI teams in our research, they are more likely to prioritize overlay integration across both DNS and DHCP, 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 saying it is a high priority for us to have a DDI solution in place that can do overlay integration with third-party DNS and third-party DHCP. Um, and they also told us they had more integration with those services. Like uh, people who were less successful told us that, well, we've managed to get some overlay integration into like AWS, where um, our cloud team is using like AWS services, like Route 53 or whatever they call it. Um, and, but we haven't been able to do the same thing in, in our Azure environment or whatever, you know? Um, and also people, in cloud ops teams and cybersecurity teams set, were the most likely to tell us that it's critical to integrate DNS, uh, to have overlay integration with DNS and DHCP, not just a full stack integrated solution from one vendor, but that vendor being able to go out and, inter and do some sort of overlay integration with third party stuff so that everything can be coordinated. Important to cloud ops, which tells you that they're in the cloud and they're seeing a problem, and they usually call their own shots in the cloud and they don't let the network team tell them what to do. And they're saying it's important. And the cybersecurity team, which is, you know, worried about the next breach, the next embarrassment. And they're saying, we need this to be integrated so that we are not vulnerable to attack because of, you know, poorly um, coordinated uh, compliance, uh, uh, network compliance, poorly coordinated security policy and DNS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. APIs, so important. I wanted to ask a lot of questions in this research about APIs because like last year I talked to someone at a very large, very large company who told me that he was doing an RFP for his incumbent, uh, he, was, he was basically subjecting his incumbent DDI vendor to an RFP because he was unhappy with APIs. He was, unha he was unhappy how his APIs enabled their APIs enabled integration with, with ServiceNow. And so he was going to rip and replace this, possibly, <laughs> because of that issue. I was like, that's a lot of disruption over this issue. And as you see here, on, you know, we asked them, how satisfied are you with the DDI's, your DDI solutions APIs? And you see almost 44% are very satisfied. That's pretty good. 47% um, are somewhat satisfied. That tells you that they're doing pretty well with the APIs that they have, but they know that something needs to be improved. That 47% there are saying, for instance, like, oh, well, I'm really good at one-way integration with this third-party platform that I need integrated with my DDI stack, but two-way integration is not happening or there are certain aspects there are certain functionalities in my ddi solution that i can't use can't get at with the api so that limits what i can do that's what you that brown section in the pie is telling you um, api satisfaction equals ddi success the people who are the most successful with ddi strategies were the most likely to tell us they're happy with these APIs. On the left at the top, you see what they typically use an API for on their DDI solution. It's about automation and orchestration. So they, for instance, integrate with their ticketing solution and then automates a lot of uh, uh, moves, ads, and changes, for, you know, for example. Or you know, an automation, integration with like a network automation tool um, can make it simplify the process of pulling IP address space and other things like you know, tagging and whatnot, VLAN tagging or something into 
uh, the network automation tool to implement an automated change. Um, security and compliance enforcement's a big one. So either like making some sort of um, integrating with a tool that's involved in that or doing some um, some uh, modification on your platform to enable some reporting or whatever. Um, and then fewer organizations saw it as a way to improve network monitoring and observability, probably by streaming data about changes into a tool that can then alert and correlate changes in DDI with like um, of events around health and performance or, or threats or whatnot. Um, and then DNS-based service discovery, you already mentioned earlier that people are really interested in, or so certain people, especially people who are highly effective with DDI are very interested in discovery. Here's another example of them leveraging APIs at that, in that direction. And then integration third-party systems in general. Uh, the essential integrations on the left, bottom left, it's about integrating with um, network security tools like firewalls, for instance, to enable like uh, automated uh, security policies being triggered based on changes in DNS or something. Um, IT service management like ServiceNow, I mentioned that's very critical. Uh, and then security monitoring tools like a SIM, also very important. And then uh, to the right of that, you see the challenges, the things that people complained about their APIs. It's bad quality. It's things are broken, don't work as expected. It's complexity. It's really hard to understand how this stuff works. How you know it's it's it should be easier to use these APIs. Maybe they're based on uh, an outdated um, format or whatever. That has needless complexity. Um, they're unhappy with documentation. It's incomplete or not updated when the actual APIs are updated. Oh, I'm being charged more licenses to use these APIs. These greedy people are charging me more money. What is that about? You know, I'm already paying them a hundred thousand bucks a year, and here they are, nickel and diming me for another um, ten thousand a year to use the APIs or whatever. Uh, and then performance, like the APIs, just don't um, resolve API calls as quickly or as well as expected or whatnot. So those are critical capabilities. Let's talk about automation. First tier of automation are the DDI workflows. So automating DDI management itself. 99% of the DDI teams we surveyed told us that they're automating some aspect of DNS, DHCP, and IP address management in their DDI tools. It's like, um, and 49% told us they completely, completely trusted those automated workflows, um, which is pretty high. Uh, almost half of them said, yeah, I, I I complete faith that this automation is going to work in this DDI tool and I use it. Still another half of them and don't completely trust it, but that's a pretty high number based on my experience. Um, top use cases for automating within a DDI stack, it's about discovery. Here's that word again. 35% um, said that's one of their top use cases. We want to be able to automate discovery of networks and also cloud. I talked to someone the other day just marveling at the fact that he had a, a DDI solution that could automatically discover every single DNS service in his cloud, his multi-cloud network, and it was saving him a lot of time and pain. 28% um, said, I just want to uh, automate IP address allocation provisioning, please just automate that as much as possible. DNS record management, another one, you know, and just automate the address syncing across DNS and DHCP and IPM. So I don't have to manually do that, please. And IPM reclamate, IP address reclamation. That's another big one. Like, oh, these IP addresses no longer used. I need to put them back in circulation because we're still on IP4 and we're running out of space. 88% um, of organizations said, DDI is our network source of truth. What is a network source of truth? Well, that's when we talk about you know, you, um, network automation in general. Like when you make an automated change, you need to understand what the intent of your network is. In other words, like what are our golden configs, for instance? Um, and what's the network state? Like when I make a change, what's it gonna look like? Uh, what does it look like? Did I break something? Am I going to wait until tomorrow to get a call that I broke something? Or can I tell now that I broke something? So source of truth is about understanding network intent and network state through a repository of data that can tell you how to make a change and whether that change will work 
and whether it worked and so forth. It's used by other network automation tools to configure and manage infrastructure. So you, you might have a network automation tool that has like its own um, source of truth. It's like, oh, here's where all the config data is. Um, I'm monitoring SNMP to get metrics from the network to see what the state is, you know. Um, but you might not have a tool like that. You might have like um, like an open source tool for orchestrating config changes and it needs to consult something else for data about the network. Um, a lot of people look at DDI solutions, particularly IP address management component of DDI as a source of truth because it has a lot of important data in it like IP address space, um, what's available, what's in use, um, VLAN to subnet mapping, um, interface configs might be in your IPAM or it might be somewhere else, uh, device adjacencies, um, security policies. Some of this can be in IPAM, some of it would be elsewhere. In my experience, most enterprises look at source of truth as a, um, a federated repository of information. They're like, okay, here, the authoritative source of truth on IP address space is in my IPAM tool, which also might have some other stuff in it that I need. Um, but my authoritative source of truth for security policies is in this tool that's owned by the cybersecurity team and authoritative source of truth for um, my golden configs is in my CMDB or my network change and configuration management tool. And I need to be able to pull authoritative data from these systems when I make a change in my network automation tool. And basically they're saying DDI is a critical component of that. 39%, um, as you see on the right, say DDI is completely effective as a source of truth. And that means that 61% see some room for improvement. Um, that's not surprising because DDI is not really fit for a purpose. Like it's not, it wasn't built 20 years ago to serve the source of truth needs of, well, you know, some some vendors are built 20 years ago, some of them built five or 10 years ago, um, to meet the needs of a network automation tool that was developed like in the last five years. It's just, it's impossible to meet that um, purpose, but it can evolve in that direction. It can meet some of the needs. And 39% are saying it's meeting most of my needs. You know, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, effectiveness of DDI as a source of truth correlated with DDI success, which tells me that a lot of enterprises need this. Um, however, um, network engineering people and IT architecture people, people who are working very closely with DDI stacks, were pessimistic about the effectiveness of DDI as a source of truth. So that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Um, uh, while people who sit in a CIO suite, which is probably as far as possible as you can get from DDI while still being in the IT organization, were overly optimistic, I think, uh, as were people like cloud ops and DevOps, which are more likely to, you know, have role-based access to a DDI tool, but don't really have much control or insight into the full capabilities of it. And they were more pest more optimistic because they're blissfully unaware of some of the things that are causing the network engineering team, the IT architecture team, pain and suffering as they try to make this work. So it's an area that needs improvement probably. Some of your DDI vendors might not even think that this is important. They might think, well, I mean, I will integrate with all the network automation tools, but I don't necessarily think that I should be serving as a source of truth. Well, a lot of people think that they should. And I think the question moving forward will be, you know, how much of how much do they do they need to provide and how should they provide it in a, you know, to ensure success for their customers? And that's a conversation you can have with your vendors about, you know, what what do you think will work here? Here's what I'm doing, here's my roadmap for network automation. How can I help? Just have that conversation um, now uh, and things will go better for you in the future. And then here's some use cases um, for a DDI based source of truth. You see it's very IP address centric for the most part. Um, so IP address tracking and auditing, making sure that a third party network automation tool understands that uh, it's using the IP address space properly through the IPM solution. Security policy management, another big priority. So there, a lot, and that was a especially a priority for people told us they work in a cybersecurity team. So they think that the um, DDI solutions should have some source of truth about security policy. That's something to keep in mind. 
Um, and then IP address submit optimization, IP address assignment, compliance controls and audits, a big opportunity. Planning and forecasting. Change tracking, kind of a low priority. Network provisioning and decommissioning, kind of a low priority too. Although I think that's pretty central to this, in my opinion. So DDI in the cloud, here's a big source of confusion and pain for so many people in the networking world. So 79% um, of the organizations that we surveyed told us that they integrate their on-prem IPAM tool with cloud IPAM for a unified approach to IP address space. So they're they're trying to, you know, either they're trying to impose their, their on-prem IPAM into the cloud, or they're trying to do some sort of integration with whatever tools the cloud team is using. Um, and multi-cloud enterprises, people that are using two, three, four different cloud providers or more, they were more aggressive. They're more likely to tell us that they're doing that integration. Um, and as you see on the right, nearly 66% of people said that they had effective integration of IPAM across multiple clouds. Like that's, that's a, a, actually it's more than 66, it's 66.5. So nearly 67%, sorry. Um, this integration is effective across all our cloud providers. That is great. That is very good. Um, a, nearly 31% said it's effective across some cloud providers, but not others. So that's not gonna go well for them. And then just 3% said that it's ineffective everywhere. So those guys are probably crying right now. Sorry guys. Uh, confidence in this integration drops with more cloud providers in production. So um, the guys who told us that they had two cloud providers in use, they were, they were like, yeah, I got good IPAM, I have consistent IPAM capabilities on-prem and in all my clouds, both of them. And then the guys that told us that they had three cloud providers, four, five, they were more likely to tell us that it's effective in some cloud providers, not in others. So that tells you there's some gaps in the industry that they're struggling with. And then here's just a quick list of the top DDI requirements people have in the cloud for IPAM functionality and DNS. So you see, um, Security pops its head up in both places. Um, it's the number two priority for IPAM. They want enhanced security measures for IPAM in the cloud. And then it's number one in DNS, 39% of people want um, security measures in um, in the cloud as a, as a, a big focus. Um, centralized visibility and control over IP address management, management assignments is, is also a big thing they want in the cloud. Um, and that makes, that's no surprise. No surprise that they want to be able to just see and control what's happening with IP address assign, assignments in the cloud. It's just, they a lot of them lost that when the cloud happened. They're just, a lot of people, a lot of times network engineering teams tell me that they just try to keep managing what's on-prem and they let the cloud team figure out what's happening in the cloud. But as people go hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, as most of the people in this survey told us that those are the big drivers of their investment in enterprise DDI solutions um, these days, um, it's no longer tenable because things need to work across environments, across the divide between on-prem and cloud. And so they need that visibility and control. Um, scale is another big one. You see uh, scalability to handle increased DNS traffic. That's the number two requirement for cloud DNS is just, you know, cloud environments are growing. There's just more DNS traffic happening. I need to be able to scale what I do in the cloud. Um, big, big, big factor moving forward. Um, these are things that people who were multi-cloud in our research were doing differently. And so I'm looking at them as possible recommendations for what to look at, what to focus on when you're trying to do multi-cloud DDI. For instance, um, they were more likely to support, um, they're more likely to try to enable um, overlay integration with multiple DNS services. Like they've just got more DNS services to deal with and they're trying to coordinate them with their core DDI stack. Um, so that's something to really focus on. Make sure that you have a DNS, a, D, a DDI solution that can play nice with all the DNS services that, um, that your cloud teams are using um, in different clouds. Uh, they're more likely to try to make DDI work as a source of truth as they are you know, driving more automation across hybrid multi-cloud networks. They need 
their DDI solution to sort of serve as a source of truth across all that. So really drive that home as you're working with your vendors on multi-cloud and as you're working with your cloud teams, trying to make them listen to you about strategy. Um, APIs, um, people who are multi-cloud are struggling with API quality. And they're also more likely to tell us that that software development kits from their um, SD their their DDI vendors are really important. They need those to be working. Uh, they need to have them. <laughs> Not every vendor has a software development kit for their APIs, as you know. Um, and also, they struggle with DDI data quality and governance. That's a big issue. They just they're finding that a lot of times, you know especially if like there's some fragmentation in tooling, there's maybe some issues with um, overlay integration, they might find that like data conflicts and quality are cropping up. So that's something you really need to keep an eye on. And then multi-cloud um, enterprises are more likely to tell us that they're, that they're integrating their DDI stack with their SIM solution for security monitoring. They're more likely to make extensive use of DNS sec um, which is, you know, a, a, a technology that the IT, the IETF developed to, uh, um, uh, ensure, um, that DNS servers have authoritative records in them through, um, uh, public key encryption. Um, and, um, they are somewhere like in a monitor DHCP in their cloud for unauthorized leases of addresses and, and, uh, malicious exhaustion attacks. So, of, of DHCP, DHCP exhaustion attacks, if you're familiar with those. It's the, uh, where uh, um, a rogue devices will, will um, blitz a DHCP server with, um, with connection requests and steal all the addresses that it has so that there are no um, addresses, addresses left on the server for legitimate requests for connectivity. So speaking of that, DDI security. So, um, 47% of the people we surveyed told us they're using DNS firewalls today. Um, DNS firewalls are an emerging technology that, that you know, you know, chances are a lot of people have a, a standard firewall with like DDI, I, with DNS specific security policies in it. And that's good. Like most people I talk to are, are doing that. Uh, a DNS firewall looks exclusively at, 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 at DNS communications like DNS queries and, 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 and um, responses to queries um, and inspects them for things like, you know, threat indicators and stuff and makes decisions about whether to allow uh, a, a, an address to be resolved. Um, basically just hardening your DNS infrastructure by pla placing a DNS firewall in front of it. It's kind of emerging. I've it's 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 somewhat mature, and you know, depending on who what vendors you're working with, uh, forty seven percent ish say they've deployed it and are protecting their networks with it today. Another forty one percent say they're implementing. That's pretty high. Um, I think it's possibly driven by knowledge gaps. The IT executives and the middle management types, like IT directors and supervisors, reported the highest adoption rates. And those people, they may have conflated DNS firewalls with DNS policies in a standard firewall. I, I can't know without talking to all 333 people I surveyed, but I, I, I think that might have pushed up the adoption rate here a little bit. The technical personnel were reporting like adoption in the 30s, I think. So they're the ones that would know best. There's also some gaps in the, between silos, like the CIO suite and the cloud ops teams reported high adoption while network engineering, net ops, and cybersecurity. Cybersecurity would be very aware of what is DNS firewall is probably as would network engineering. Um, they reported the lowest adoption rates. So more important um, on the left-hand side, we asked in that pie chart, how confident are you that all of your organization's DNS infrastructure is sufficiently secure? Only 31% told us they're very confident. 54% said somewhat confident. Somewhat confident means that they thought of something that's not good. <laughs> you know, or, you know, for instance, well, you know what? Um, I'm aware of a couple of servers that are, I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're secure, like, cause I don't really have any say in what's happening with them. Um, it could be a toxic swamp. I don't know. Um, so, or they're, you know, they just, I, I can't get, 
I can't get log data adequately out of my certain parts of my DNS infrastructure. So it's not getting reviewed by my SIM. So I don't really have complete visibility. So I'm somewhat confident. And then you see eight, eh, six, seven, almost 7% are like, things are bad, very bad. And no surprise, confidence in DNS security correlates with overall DDI success. It's something you need to get right, which tells you the DDI uh, teams, the people responsible for DNS, DHCP, and IP address management, which is some people traditionally thought of as a utility that just is there and works, and don't we don't really need to think about it. I remember talking to people 20 years ago, like, oh, yeah, we got a DNS server that I haven't looked at in five years. Um, it's fine. Um, that's not tenable. DDI teams need to be part of a security strategy. They need to be working with a cybersecurity team if the cybersecurity team doesn't already work with them. Um, they need to be talking about security policy, hardening things. It's critical. People who are more um, confident in their DNS security um, were more likely to tell us these things under potential best practices. They said they had more influence over cloud strategy, which is a question I asked them. Do you think that the team responsible for DDI in your enterprise has enough influence over your company's cloud strategy? And people who said, yes, we have all the influence we need, were the most likely to tell us that they are very confident in DNS security. That should tell you something. Also, stay away from Microsoft DNS. People who told us that they had Microsoft DNS in their network were less confident in DNS security. So I'm just gonna point that out right here. Um, that's an indicator of insecurity. Not necessarily that Microsoft DNS in itself is an insecure platform, but they didn't have the right automation and management around it to make sure that it's consistently in compliance with whatever, whatever, with whatever security policies they have. That's what I think is happening there. Um, they are also more likely to report extensive integration of IPAM with DNS. Makes sense. Like any change that happens in DNS gets flagged in an IPAM solution, for instance, or vice versa. Um, API quality. People who told us that the, they're unhappy with the quality of their APIs were more likely to tell us that their DNS security was less, you know, they're, they're, they're more pessimistic about it or less likely if feel like it was bulletproof. So, um, and, and we already saw that like, um, that's like a, a, a significant use case for API quality is, you know, um, security policy and compliance policy controls and enforcement and things like that. Um, also, they're more likely to um, focus on getting uh, network and cloud discovery capabilities with their DEI solution. They want to be able to discover everything that's out there so they can see what their unknown, un, their, uh, what's the unknown unknowns or known unknowns? Like they want to see what they don't see already when they first, um, you know, turn on their network. <laughs> like, like what's out there that we don't know about? Rogue DNS servers, uh, rogue DHCP server. I need to discover all this. I need to discover all the devices on my network that have an IP address. I need to know what's out there so I can make sure it's in compliance with whatever security policies you have so I can see if it's acting weird. Um, discovery is an important piece. And then of course, no surprise, they're more likely to have a DNS firewall deployed. And they're also more likely to be implementing uh, uh, DNS security extensions. Um, Confidence gaps, just one last thing to point out here. IT executives are twice as confident as technical personnel and middle management in their DNS security. That's concerning. <laughs> and the CIO suite and the cloud ops team are more confident than network engineering, net ops, and cybersecurity. That's concerning as well. So people who work the closest with the technology are the most pessimistic about DNS security. So I think the picture is uglier than in the pie chart on the left is showing us. Finally, don't neglect IPAM and DHCP security. 24% of the people in the survey told us that they take no steps whatsoever to secure DHCP, and 22% said they take no steps to secure IPAM. Um, so that's not good. Um, security concerns that people had for DHCP, even people who told us they take no steps to secure it, they had concerns. 
Uh, 34% told us they um, are worried about DHCP based network reconnaissance. Like, hey, I'm going to hit that DHCP server with a request and see what kind of information it'll give me about the network. Um, exhaustion attacks, where I mentioned that that's an issue. Um, and then unauthorized DHCP leases and IP address assignments, like rogue devices tricking a DHCP server into giving them connectivity in the network. Um, 22%, uh, uh, the top IPAM security concerns, like 40% said they're worried about unauthorized IP address lo allocation. That could be malicious activity or just stupid activity. 34% um, said they had inadequate authentic authentication and access controls on their IPAM tool. And 32% said they had poor visibility IP address management, uh, IP address assignments, and so that they couldn't tell if they're giving addresses to devices that are out of policy or rogue or what have you. you know. um, people who are doing well with um, DDI in general, we're more likely to tell us that they're doing the following things to secure infrastructure, DDI stacks. They're more likely to integrate their, their uh, DDI tools with network access control and use other authentication and author authorization methods to further lock down their systems. They are more likely to isolate their DHCP servers and their IP, uh, IP address management servers with, via uh, network segmentation. Like you're doing like a zero trust micro segmentation scheme in your data center, for instance, make sure you're trying to extend some of that to the, the DDI stack uh, to protect it from bad behavior. Um, they're monitoring logs and events coming out of their, their tools. Their, their, their DDI stack, they um, make sure they harden the servers as much as possible, as regularly as possible that are hosting this stuff. So like, you know, if you're running um, DHCP on some Linux server that's out in like, um, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, that make sure that you're regularly patching it. Um, and they also um, are encrypting traffic between IPAM servers and endpoints, which I don't think is necessarily a good idea, but a lot of them who are doing well at DDI were doing that. Um, it might make sense for some of you, depending on what resources you have on your network to enable that. So final thoughts. Um, cloud transformation and network automation are driving DDI investments and are making it so that DDI is no longer this utility that you just forget about. You turn on the faucet, it works. Nope. You need to be diligent. You need to have an enterprise grade solution to, if you want to make things happen in the cloud and with automation. Uh, so DDI teams must fight for influence over cloud strategy. We found that that correlates strongly with success in a lot of ways. And it came up a little bit in, in my presentation already. They need to partner closely with cybersecurity. People who did that, um, DDI teams that had close relationships with cybersecurity were uh, doing better with DDI. And they need to lead on network automation strategy. So you need to stand up and say, I think that our IPAM tool can be an important resource for our network automation strategy. I want to have a conversation with you. You are out there doing all this stuff and you're probably just gonna assume that you're gonna integrate with my tool when you're ready to go into production. I think we should have a conversation now and make sure it's fit to purpose as much as possible. Um, on the right, these are things that people told us that were most likely to cause them significant pain with their DDI strategy. Network complexity. Network is too complex. We can't discover everything we need to discover because of like these firewall rules that are everywhere or whatever. Think about the complexity of the network as you're modernizing or updating your DDI stack. Uh, IT culture, resistance to change. People are like, hey, I love this spreadsheet. <laughs> I've been maintaining it for 15 years. I'm not going to use your newfangled tool with all the bells and whistles on it. Well, no, you're going to do it. And if you try to circumvent it, I'm going to make sure I know it. And I'm going to report you to the principal. Um, Data quality and governance, that came up as an issue earlier in a different context, but people told us that um, data quality is an issue that can undermine their strategy. And then skills gaps, a lot of people might have just like one person in an IT organization of like 800 that really knows everything, ins and outs of this stuff. So you might wanna train more people on it um, or allow them to, have role-based access to pieces of it so they can learn how to use it um, more directly so that 
you don't have to rely on your one expert to do everything in this space, this space um, that's something to keep an eye on. So that's it for me. You can see the cover of the report. It's like a 60 page documents in our research library. Um, there's a link that you can use to download it. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Raleigh for Q to uh, facilitate Q&A. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Seamus. I will provide a link to the report in that follow-up email. So if you want to learn more, check that out. Seamus, jumping into the questions, the first one is, I have no influence over DNS services in the cloud. What do you recommend? Yeah, so I think the majority of enterprises have uh, DDI people who um, have at least some limits around how much influence they have in the cloud. They like to have more. Um, if your DAI solution has a strong set of well-documented APIs with a software development kit, introduce it to the cloud team because they'll probably be like, oh, this looks fun to play with. Um, show them how they can integrate their management tools with DDI so they can have a, a self-service portal to IPM, DNS, because most of them are probably going to say, you know what? The network team is so annoying. Whenever I ask for an IP address, I have to wait like two hours to get a response. What if you could give them APIs that allow them to make a call to your DDI stack so that they get that information automatically within minutes, if not seconds? I think that um, if you can show them how you have an enterprise grade solution with good APIs that can enable automation of their environment, they're gonna be like, hey, okay, we'll listen to you. What else can you do? Can you manage some of our DNS? Cause it's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, that's a good icebreaker. So that's one thing you could do. Um, you could also tell them about how um, you have an enterprise, enterprise grade DDI solution that's really good at securing DNS um, in certain ways that they may not be aware of. And that might set off a little light bulb because they're probably constantly being bugged by the cybersecurity team for being really bad at security around certain things. And they'll be like, oh, you know, I just got to an email from the CISO about how um, there's a lot of problems with our DNS stack. If you can secure that, we'll have, we'll, let's have a meeting. So those are a couple of things that you can try. Thanks, Seamus. This individual wants you to elaborate on DHCP security and how to address it with DDI. I mean, it depends on what vendor you're using. Um, uh, I, I mentioned some of the things you can do. I mean, you can you can make sure that the servers that your DHCP servers are on are hardened. Um, you can have um, you you might want a DDI vendor to show you what they can do around things like auditing what happens with the DHCP servers, um, like being able to monitor and audit to monitor DHCP activity within your DDI stack, and also to audit. Um, uh, network compliance requirements for DHCP. If you have a DDI tool that can address things like that, that can help a lot. Um, but you also want to segment your network to make sure that your DHCP servers are not easy to reach um, from malicious IPs, for instance, or from anyone really outside your network. Um, there's no reason why like a DHCP, DHCP server in your campus network should be reachable from the internet, for instance. Um, so, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things. You should definitely have a conversation with your DDI vendors about DHCP security um, because there are specific malicious um, um, vulnerabilities. There are specific vulnerabilities that are exploited um, occasionally. So keep an eye on it. Good to know. Thank you. This attendee wants to know: Do you recommend investing in an automation tool on top of the existing DDI solution? Yeah. Um, I mean, DDI automates IP address management space, DNS, and DHCP, but they're not automating things like um, router configs or, um, you know, they're not going to configure your software-defined WAN. They're not going to configure your Wi-Fi. They're not going to configure um, your uh, data center switching environment. Like, But they are going to provide a lot of data that the automation tools that handle that stuff need. Like, um, so you want to have integrations with other automation platforms. And so, yeah, you're going to buy a th third-party automation tool to automate 
the rest of your network, um, the DDI solution you have should be able to automate every workflow that's DDI specific, like IP address allocation and um, reclamation and DNS record management. That stuff should be automated as much as possible. Um, but you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna need a third-party network automation tool to automate the rest of your network for sure. Great, thank you. Did your research look at IPv6 adoption? Yes, uh, we asked them a few questions about that. We saw significant engagement, like 38% of them said that they were using it extensively in their networks. Um, and and IP, IP, IPv4 address exhaustion was not a significant driver of that. I think it was like the last driver. Like we gave them a list of like six or seven things that they could cite as a reason for using IPv6 on the networks. and v4 address exhaustion was at the bottom of the list instead they were looking to improve network performance and efficiency like they were aware of people talking about how ipv6 is more efficient uses less resources on your network in some certain ways so they thought that they could improve that they also were aware that ipv6 has certain um security features that can improve their overall security risk uh, manage help them manage security risk overall in the IP network. So they're citing that as a driver. And many of them just told us they were trying to just simply feature-proof their network, not necessarily against IPv4 address exhaustion, but just like outdated technology. Like, oh, you know, someday one of our vendors is going to only support IPv6. So I need to be ready for that day. I, I don't know if that day will ever come, but that's just an example. Like I, I talked to one network engineer at a consulting company that does like a lot of IT consulting engagements. Like they, um, you know, they do a lot of IT management, ser IT services. And, and he said that his company did an aggressive adoption of IPv6 because they just needed to show their customers that they were cutting edge. Um, so that was why they were engaged with it. Um, uh, we also asked them about why they might not be using IPv6 or not using it as much as they could. And the two things that told, that held them back were uh, cost of network upgrades because they got certain um, uh, network devices or network software on their network that needs to be upgraded to support IPv6. And then they also cited skills gaps as the other big thing. They just had people that just didn't know how to work with IPv6, fully leveraging it for whatever they wanted to do with it. So that was holding them back. So that's what we saw with IPv6. Excellent. Thanks, Seamus. And I wanted to thank our audience for joining us today. As I mentioned, you will be receiving a follow-up email from EMA today with resources from today's webinar. So I hope you'll check that email out. And I hope we'll see you at a future EMA research webinar. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.